The Strange Motion Way Podcast, brought to you by Royal Purple Synthetic Oils. Royal Purple Premium Synthetic Motor Oils and High Performance Chemicals have been designed to improve performance in all conditions and provide cleaner operation, better mileage, and decreased oil change frequency. That means less oil changes. With products available for your gasoline and diesel engines, Royal Purple is the obvious choice for your performance needs. Drive with Royal Purple, the synthetic expert. Okay, welcome back to a part two of the Strange Motion Way podcast. I am your host, Tim Strange, with... Harry Strange. Um, last week's episode, we had this guy here, Brian Brennan, and it was our longest recorded interview <laughs> we've done on the Strange Motion Way podcast. And then Carrie uploaded it at an event, didn't you? I was. And that might be part of the problem, too. She usually <laughs> listens to them all the way through when they go up, and she just has them going in the background while she's doing her work. And uh, this one, we didn't get time to do that. And then, in a good thing, people start messaging us. One was you. You said your grandkids found it. But people <laughs> are listening to it all the way through. They haven't shut it off at half an hour. So we've had quite a bit response uh, hey, you know, we, we can't hear Brian Brennan after two hours and 13 minutes. So <laughs> we're going to try to do a little bit of a 20 minute episode here. I'm, it might go a little bit more. I put, took some notes so we make sure we hit the topics that we were. So quick introduction again. We got Mr. Brian Brennan. He is a current editor of the Modern Rotting Magazine, part of the new group of In the Garage Media. He's been in the print stuff for many, many years. Started back with McMullen. Even before, I was talking to somebody this weekend, didn't know you were there that long, even before Street Rider Magazine started. So he was there from the beginning, worked at Rod Action, back at Street Rider again. And another thing that we didn't touch on, he's a football referee. So <laughs> yes. welcome back for part two, Brian Brennan. Well, uh, thank you both, uh, Tim and Kerry. Uh, while you were doing that, I just had an epiphany <laughs> Maybe someone's trying to tell us something, why the sound cut off at two hours and the next maybe they're done. You know? Well, I do have to giggle because when we started recording it that night, we we had commented about how long it was going to go. And you're like, yeah, I listened to one of them or seen one of them that was two hours long. Yeah, and you, you said our other than Daryl Starbird was almost three hours, but we recorded him in separate sections. Yeah. So I kind of went back and listened to try to figure out the, the it was still there of me and Carrie only and not you. So pretty much where it starts shut off and we'll start there and pick off, pick up is when you guys started in the garage media. And so let's touch just a little bit about the ending of those magazines. I think we talked about that when they killed street yeah. rotter and stuff, but just a little update on that and then go into starting in the garage media. Sure. Well, the magazines were canceled back in 2019, and it was at literally at the Grand National Roadster Show in 2020 that everyone's cell phone went off and received a text message that basically said, pick up your check. You know, that was the short version. And uh, 19 of the 21 books were cut. Uh, so here we are. We're all without a job. Uh, a few people were retained to stay on hot rod and i was one of them uh that only lasted i'm not even sure if it was three weeks to a month you know before because when it went down tim foss and i had been talking about well we knew it was coming so let's do we want to go out on our own do we want to try to do something and with the the coming on of covid we thought, what a better time to start a magazine and, and blow through our savings and investment money and everything else than start a magazine company when the economy is shut down. <laughs> and um, in hindsight, I'm sure future history books will say all kinds of things, but in hindsight, it was probably the single best thing that happened for us. It gave us a level playing field and a number of advertisers were left with ad budgets and no place to go at the time. Yeah. Now, everyone was afraid of what was going to happen and all of this, but we had a, a handful of people who had enough faith in us to just jump on board and, and help us get going. And fortunately, they've stayed with us and others have come aboard. And the two books grew into three books by the J January time frame of 2021. And that's when all Chevy performance came on. Modern Rotting and Classic Truck Performance were the first two books. 
and so they Rob, were bi monthly. Fortier is the truck magazine. Yeah. And then Nick Licata yeah. does the, the All Chevy magazine. That is correct. And for those who remembered, Rob was doing the truck book back when we shut down plastic trucks, and Nick was doing, uh, uh, you know, an All Chevy book uh, at the time uh, when we were back there in the old company. Um, speaking about starting dates and all that, I just had an epiphany. Earlier in our conversation, we were talking about when Street Rotter start, started. Mm -hmm. And I said, I thought it was May of 71. It was actually May of 72. Okay. But that's a really interesting story. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Miller from the Northwest started a book called Street Rod. And it came out in October of 71. We were planning on coming out. That was going to be our Street Rodder's original title was going to be Street Rod. We had produced the covers, the magazine, the whole thing. And then he comes out with his book and we go, uh-oh. So we had to go back in and we came up with the title, which you would think was simple enough, but we had to go back in and change all of the folios on the pages and everywhere where we said Street Rod, mm -hmm. we had to change to Street Rodder. And so that caused a little delay. Uh, and that led us to coming out in May of 72 with Street Rotter. But but that's how all that happened. The, the reality is Street Rotter may have come out three to four months earlier had that not occurred. Uh, but there you go. So what else you got? <laughs> so we, I think we talked right now. You have uh, no idea to add another magazine at this. The three titles, you guys are really comfortable with that. You got, you know, good ads in there. There's a good tech in them. They all kind of have their own little yeah. niche. They're slightly different. So, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, just adding those magazines during COVID, like you said, but then people were probably home reading their magazines. I know I got out a few stacks of magazines because we weren't going to as many events. There still was a handful of yep. events out here, but not as many. But yeah. like the logistics side of that, how hard was it when a lot of the places were not working and places were closed down? How hard was it to even like find a printer at that time that could print? That? Well, here again, the best of times and the worst of times. If you remember, I was heading up the, the hot rod group at the old company. And so I knew who the printers were and I knew the distributors and all that. We literally went back to the printer that was doing a number of our books. And one of them was Vet Magazine. And, and Vet Magazine was a slightly larger format, but it was on much better paper and a cover and whatnot, because it was a very small print run book. And I said, I will take Street Rotter, or excuse me, I will take, uh, we wanted Street Rotter slot, but we yeah. couldn't get it. I will take Vet Magazine's paper and their printing slot. Just change the name on the contract. You still oh, have okay. the same contact. So we did. And, and so conveniently we slid into that spot now for those of you who carry uh who keep all of the issues of magazines you'll notice the first three or so issues of modern rotting were slightly smaller than the current issues mm -hmm. that's because we literally matched vet magazine mechanically okay mm -hmm. so we just slid right in used their paper and whatnot and when it came time for us to sign our own contract and buy paper we buy paper a year in advance that is held for us mm -hmm. and it comes out of Canada and is then shipped down to the United States. I'm talking to the printer and I said, well, I really would like to make it a little larger format and just give it a better feel and whatnot. And he says, well, and he sends me some examples and he says, because the width of your paper is already X wide, we can make your book slightly larger. And it'll, it, the only thing it'll increase is some trim costs, which were dollars. It, it was really nothing. He says, but keep this in the back of your mind. It will increase the weight of each magazine. Mm. So now your freight charges will go up. Yep. Then we did some quick math and said, you know what? It's worth it. So those early viewers of, uh, you know, uh, classic truck performance, and then modern rotting, you'll notice your first three or so issues are slightly smaller, and then the book goes to the larger format. So that's how we did that. And then as far as distribution, that was a little bit more of a challenge, but nobody was doing anything at the time, or very little. Because at first so you people, were just subscription only. You weren't on the stands anywhere, right? That is correct. 
we were subscriptions both print and and electronically meaning you could get a digital version of the magazine through vertical so when you look at it online it looks identical mm -hmm. to, to the print book it's just online um we early on we went to some of the specialty bookstores and and things like that and we were accepted and then by the end of the first full year all of a sudden we get a phone call from uh uh you know, the big box stores and like a Walmart and they go, we'll put you in some test stores. It's about 300 stores and it'll be west of the Mississippi and we'll give it a try. And then if it does well, we'll look at certain other zip codes and then specific stores. And now remember, they had access to all of the sales literature, but not literature, but all of the sales data from Hot Rod and Car Craft and Motor Trend and Street Rotter, you know, and, and all of the other books. So we, when we were asked to expand, we got to cherry pick the, the zip codes. And by cherry picking the zip codes and then finding the stores that were in that area, we've been able to roll it out now for about a year and a half to where we're in approximately 600 of their stores which is still just scratching the surface. You didn't pick our zip code. No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> the, the, um, but we're getting there. But, our Walmart has zero car yeah, magazines yeah, or truck magazines. I think there's maybe like an auto buyer magazine. Every yeah. once in a while, there used to be a street trucks would still show up. And like, yeah, I, I think there might be a diesel magazine there. But yeah. There's no hot rod. There's not you. There's just yeah. so. Our town's probably just small enough being out of Nashville a half an hour that none of those magazines have picked our little circle area. Well, when they cut back all the magazines and the big box stores killed their newsstands, they immediately made that real estate available to that type of product, which sells well. So now try to go back in and replace that. Mm -hmm. That's a, you're losing battle there. So it's going to take time, but it is happening and we're very happy about it. And, um, uh, you know, yeah, we're on the new stand. It's not like it used to be, but we're slowly but surely doing it. The fact of the matter is the new stand is a very difficult place to survive because you have to print 10 magazines in order to sell three or four. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that right now, but that's just a tough business model to, to be successful at. Whereas the digital magazine, well, that's, you know, there's no print or distribution or ink costs or anything so what, like what that. What is the numbers? I mean, I think it's very weird that somebody wouldn't want the print magazine. If you can't look mm -hmm. around, I have magazines here and binders. And yeah. I just got a whole big collection of magazines. And, my, you know, this is my wife's not impressed look. Because um, <laughs> I have a lot. I finally bought some bookshelves for the shop yeah. the last couple of weeks to start putting them up and organizing them and everything. And uh, what is, does most people still get the print or does, is they starting to just get the online thing? It, what's interesting is, but to answer your question, the short version, electronically is much bigger, mm -hmm. much bigger than print. But print is growing and we seem to get a lot more feedback. And, and that may actually be because of the type of person who is used to a print magazine and, and, is used to writing a letter. I still get letters in this mm -hmm. day and age. And But what you have to remember is you can get modern rotting as a print, as a digital. You can get a newsletter twice a month. You can go visit it on our website. You can go visit it in social media. Um, there's so many different ways to get the book. Mm -hmm. And our newsletter is a screaming home run. And it's going out a couple of times a month. And we're talking, we're pushing 200,000. Oh, wow. I mean, that's a lot of yeah. people mm -hmm. twice a month. Now, it's not the full magazine by any stretch. Yeah. And what it is, is it's popular stories from the past and then some teaser stories that are coming up and then news items mm -hmm. because it is so current, you know, what's happening right now. And, and it's all three books into one. So you can see stories from all of the books. Uh, so that's very, very popular. Uh, but in time, 
as much as it may pain me to say this, I think the digital version will just become the standard, you know, it, somewhere down the road. That's sad um, for me. That's it, for, it, that's sad. it is. And I know you've heard the, yeah. hey, <laughs> it's in between the time the three of us have spoken last time and now some guy sent me a handful of old magazines and I'm looking at them go, I don't have those. <laughs> you know, so into the collection they go. Yeah, but, I just recently, I don't know if I talked about it on that last one, purchased very cheap because big collections are hard to move. You can't ship them. Buddy, my buddy Adam picked them up in Milwaukee and brought them to me. Yeah, Starting in like mid to late 60s, hot rods, and half of mm -hmm. them are in the branded binders, uh, not missing an issue. So John McGann, the editor of Hot Rod, says, I currently have new more magazines. He doesn't really know that I have like triples of a lot of those. Era. Yeah. I'm missing some of the first. I don't have everything the first four or five years in the 40s and early 50s of Hot Rod. But he goes, I have more than Hot Rod themselves done because they pitched so much. They kept, yep. you know, scanned them and put them online, the Peterson online archive. And he goes, they just recently pitched. They had a copy of everything, like the best, you know, almost mint. And he goes, I was out of town. Another guy that would get some, and they threw them all in the dumpster. And yeah, the to me is this sad. One of the projects that I was involved with before, let's say, a, two three years before the magazine's demise, we had literally a warehouse out in Riverside, huge, huge warehouse uh, that was run by our print company but it was for paper shredding mm -hmm. and they did paper shredding out there, but they had all the magazines we'd ever done the history on all of the books. And that was a lot of books. Mm -hmm. And one day Doug Evans came to me and said, we've got to empty it out. It's your job to decide what we keep and what we throw away. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, how am I going to say these 25 issues of this particular book? He goes, Brennan, Here's what it's costing us. And I went, oh crap. No. And 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 I realized it, it just isn't a feasibility. So I was the hatchet man and I went through there and I literally had a chute that came out of the second story down to a dumpster. Mm -hmm. And the guys that were working there, I said, okay, oh, take oh this magazine God. and this year's and pitch them. And I would go to lunch and just sit there with my <laughs> head down and just going, oh my God, now. The upside was me being. Have you ever thrown a puppy? And... Have you ever thrown a puppy in a dumpster? Oh that's God, what, no! That's what no. it feels like to me when you oh. did. They made they made you throw puppies away. That it was brutal, <laughs> Tim. To this day, I still think I can still picture me looking at this magazine, going, "You've got to be kidding!" Mm. Into the chute. Now. Uh, all of the issues of, of all of the popular books you and I would think were popular for us. Um, you know, we kept and had them put away and they were sent to, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the, the Peterson, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the museum, the, the Peterson museum on yep. Wilshire Boulevard. Okay. Yep. Down in the basement, that's where they keep the extra cars before they're brought up to either be re refurbished repaired whatever restored and then put on display that's but there was one of the good yeah. stuff is like cadzilla's oh. down there <laughs> last time i was there the hero hot of merc was there I oh, think before it, it went no it was already at galp and then it, yeah before that the time before the hero was oh, there's yeah there's so much cool stuff down there you just you just faint you know i mean it, it's just truly amazing but there was a an area set off in one corner and it was chained off and it was literally all of the old Peterson files, you know, uh, files for color film and black and white prints. They were either typical drawers that slide out like at a library, you know, and you look yeah. through the index cards. Well, they had everything so nicely done. And then, uh, all, you know, then actual prints and all of this stuff. The things that I found there were staggering. And we were trying to get them over to where they were scanning them. Thomas Warringer at the time was in charge of scanning these and then putting them electronically into electronic files and then keeping them forever. I don't know how many he actually got done. I do know it was several million, but we threw away eventually twice, three times that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the original film, 
yeah, it's too bad you couldn't have got to somebody yeah. like, I mean, I collect, but somebody that like Jerry Dixie, he gets and then he sells to people, right? And then yeah. there's somebody else that does that too. Um, somebody else we know, but yeah, some of them guys they gather and then they're yeah. like, oh, they they sell to people like groups and stuff like well, that or places them and you know, Tim, I I went to the people in charge and I said, I can't take it all. But I'd love to keep some of this and take it. And they said, if you take one photo out of here, we will charge you with theft. Oh, gee. And they were dead. They were dead serious. Dead serious. In their mind, this was proprietary information. And if you take it somewhere else, someone else is going to make a buck off of it that we didn't get because it was ours. Uh -huh. And my mistake was I tried to be a nice guy and ask for permission. I should have just told yeah. Yeah. forgiveness but that's yeah and then right carrie yeah. and then ask for forgiveness so that that was a sad sad day but um yeah you know, it's the way it goes but so thank you for keeping print alive i hope you keep print alive yeah. uh as long as you can it's not just all digital but there is a lot of people yeah a lot of magazines did die but there's still a lot of different types of magazines you guys have your yep. modern rotting your classic trucks um you're all chevy oh. And then there's like the boutique magazines. We talked a little bit about this before. You got the Rotter's Journal. It took a little break there for a little bit. There was some yeah. family issues and stuff. And now he's got a good office and getting that. That's like a boutique. Like, well, it used to be four times a year. It comes out once every eight months or something like that now. <laughs> and then you got the guys, which you probably worked with them back in the day at some of the magazines. You got uh, the uh, Wheel Hub guys. Robert yeah. Robert McGaffin and they're like in a in a complimentary where they're like a boutique like Writer's Journal they come out four times a year they're thick and like coffee yeah. table looking books and everybody's doing everybody I think compliments each other everybody's kind of doing their their own thing um, we're kind of yeah. over the times where there was so many magazines I remember with our 63 Rivy I just did a social media post last week about that car because we were talking about it before the yeah. recording stopped um, the summer that car got down in 2001, it got shot. It was in in the same same year. It was in six magazines and five covers around the world, and but they were all different. But you know there was, yeah. um, I mean, it wasn't in car craft, but it was in hot rod. It was in popular hot rodding. It was in custom rodder. It was in chrome and flames in Germany, and it was in all those. And it the, the industry almost kind of needed to trim some fat because there was a lot of almost the same type of magazines. Um, I was really upset when they killed Popular Hot Rodding, even before they killed all the other ones, because I was a big Popular Hot Rodding fan, too, because Project X. And uh, everybody's doing a, a good job with all these print. And some people think that all the magazines went away. I see that monthly on social media. Oh, there's no print magazines anymore. Well, no, there is. Just take the blinders off and look around. And there's a lot of people doing great stuff. We're, we're over that time that you guys and... Riders Journal and Wheel Hub is going to shoot the same car, and that's fine because then it's not the cars aren't given getting flooded in the market. So, oh, if you want to see that car behind you, it was on the cover of Modern Riding. It was the AMBR car, and uh, so yeah, I, there's still room for everybody, I think. And like you guys do tech, and the Wheel Hub guys don't do tech and Wheel Hub or the truck book. They do a Mustang book too, I think. I'm not a Mustang guy. Um, but there's very few well, people like you that like them all. There's a lot of those, a lot of people that have their niche, and that's that's what they like. They they focus on what each individual magazine. Yeah, produces. back in the day, some guys just read Rod and Custom. Some guys just were street rider, mm -hmm. and yeah. they were slightly different. Sometimes cars would get in both, but I'm I'm just a nerd. I just like it all. But I mean, I don't do many Corvette magazines. Sorry, you I know you ran the Corvette <laughs> magazine. I don't do Mustang magazines. Um, but it's mostly hot rods, rod and custom, and BMX stuff. So, yeah, it the magazines nowadays, and they and to a certain degree they did before. But first off, all of the staff guys all got along for, from the different magazines. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Robert McGaffin, you mentioned Wheel Hub. I mean, Robert is a, is a really good friend and still is to this day. And every time we see each other, we pick up where the conversation ended and mm -hmm. and we move on. Um, the books being competitive to a certain degree is a good thing mm -hmm. it keeps everyone on their toes and it keeps you hustling and and you don't take anything for granted so i love the fact i wish there were more now some people will say well that's going to water down your advertising dollar and and all of that there may be some truth to that 
But in my opinion, if you put your best foot forward and you do the best job you can and the readers follow you, so will the advertisers. Yeah. Right. So, so it's all good. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So we talked about a few other things. Um, we did talk. I want to make sure we talk about this because you said of all the people we ask about this, like we did Corey and a Ashley Talbert and their cat people. So we talked about cats. We have our <laughs> we got one sleeping right over here before we started recording. Little Axel was licking Carrie's yeah. hair and everything. But you were one of the few people that we asked that you said you have actually been to a professional cat show. Oh, yeah. Sure. I'm a nerd. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Say, when we walked uh, in, it's like we were like, did you see that on social media? There's a cat show locally up in Nashville. And it's like we were home and it's like, let's go. This is like two winters ago, last winter or something. So we went up, made a day of it. And it's like we're walking in and we're thinking, is this going to be cheesy or goofy? You know, I grew up showing pigs and cattle in 4-H. So I was like, oh, it's got to be something like that. It's got to be cool, right? And uh, so I paid for my hot rod parts, my BMX stuff, my show pigs. I, yeah. And uh, so we're as we're walking in. There's all walks of life coming out, and nobody did not have a smile on their face. Everybody was happy. They were in a good mood. From the grandparents to what whatever walk of life you're from, everybody was having fun. And we went in there, and there's every type of cat. You can talk oh, to yeah. the breeders. There's kittens available from the breeders. And Carrie looked up about cat judging, that if you have enough uh, seniority of breeding and judging, you can make almost $80,000 doing a, being a cat judge. So I thought Carrie was going to totally change her <laughs> her <laughs> mode of career. I'm still like, yeah. I'd be okay with it. But then we uh, we talked about it. It's like, man, it's like not in a derogatory uh, comment, but there was always these ISCA is still big, but it, when it was really, really big, like when the circuit, when you used to win a truck or a Mustang for the championship, everybody would get slightly dressed up for the awards, right? And, and match some their of them, car. And what? And match their car. Oh, yeah, and match their cars. And like oh. some of them people you'd see, which... Uh, yeah. I, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm it's just going to call out Tana Mank. She had this suede thing yeah. with the fringe. The fringe. <laughs> the fringe. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which it, I remembered the fringe suede because... See Dave Kendig this weekend, his daughter, they were going on a bus to go on a steak dinner so they could drink and stuff. Mm -hmm. She goes, come on, I got my fringe jacket on. Mm -hmm. I got to have steak. <laughs> so she had a fringe jacket on like that, too. But it's like all those slightly eccentric 80s, early 90s ISCA people, we joked that day. It's like, well, they sold their cars. They sold their big truck and trailer. Now they're showing they cats. Their cats. Yeah. Because we've seen slightly some eccentric outfits. You know, you have to dress up when you're showing and yeah. uh, it was absolutely incredible. So if anybody's never been to a cat show, we would highly recommend going to a cat show. Oh, it and and if my wife and I, we take it one step further. When we go up to our house in Idaho, it is it, this is part of the ritual. We go to the big box store in town and we back the pickup truck up and we'll buy three, four, five hundred dollars worth of goods and then go out to the local animal shelter mm -hmm. and then donate it all. The vast majority of it is clearly cat material. You know? yeah. And, yeah. and because we do that, I get to go there and play with the kitties and, and the cats and just have a good time. Um, have you ever yeah, participated and showed a cat? I have never shown a cat. Yeah, just been to shows and looked at them. Um, uh, my cats are a little bit thuggish. <laughs> I mean, they're, Ours they're not are, no, no offense, kitty. They would be called what you would call... Uh, cat mutt. Um, yes. Not really a, yes. a special breed. <laughs> He's, uh oh, Turbo's yeah. coming over like, who are you calling a mutt? <laughs> He's like, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. My cats come, they're either all black, all gray, black and white, and one, we're not sure how many colors she is, but she's got the <laughs> rainbow going in there, the total spectrum. So slightly but, off. I don't know if you've seen the yeah. social media girl, the, uh, how do we say this? The Hawk 2 girl. Have you seen any of that? I don't think so. It's probably good. Um, but there's <laughs> this, this lady, this girl that went viral from downtown the CMA, CMT Fest about how to keep a man. And I mean, yeah. I can say it uncensored. She's like, you got a Hawk 2, you got to spit on it, you know? So <laughs> she blew up. She's literally from the next town over, this super small town. And yeah. since she's starting now, she has a podcast. She just, she's obviously making more money off her podcast than we are. Mm -hmm. But I seen a thing the other day. She has made over a million dollars this summer doing appearances and all this just from this viral joke video. But the cool thing is 
They said that she has donated this summer alone. I mean, she don't know how long her 15 minutes for seconds of fame is going to last. She started a foundation. She has already donated over a half a million dollars to animal rescue places. So oh, fantastic. She's like this yeah. young girl who takes care in her 20s, takes care of her grandma. And from yeah. her dirty joke, she's doing this. And but she started a foundation. But the day one, they said that she got a thirty thousand dollar check for something, and she went and spent five thousand dollars and took it to the local animal rescue mm-hmm. place instead. So yeah, yeah, you can have dirty jokes and sense of humor, and you're doing good things with your money for the animals. So yeah, yeah. she stepped up a couple things in in my book that way. So one thing we did forget to talk about Take a breath. last week. Take a breath. <laughs> was I just learned this in the last year? Tell everybody what you do outside of the print and the hot rod world. Well, I assume you don't mean the fact that I still race bicycles and, uh, oh. you know, oh, race bikes. I didn't know that. I, I forgot. Yeah. About, you know, we're BMXers. Carrie yeah. got hurt pretty bad this year, but uh, yeah, I, I assume you don't do BMX, though. No, 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 no. This would be road racing um, or time trialing. Time trialing was my specialty, and I started that back when I was in my 30s. It's, the one thing about cycling is, as you get older, you naturally get slower. So mm-hmm. they make groups of old people, yep. of which I am in the top group. Mm-hmm. And and all of us can lie to each other because, well, shit, I used to be able to do this and do yeah. that. <laughs> and then we go out there and it looks like a bunch of old men just putting around. Them, but yeah. we think we're tearing it up. Yeah, we watch videos and, you know, when we're racing, it's like, man, I am going so fast. I need to tap my brakes. And you watch a video and it's like. It looks like I'm going so slow as how am I not falling over? You know, we don't jump in BMX anymore. We don't leave the ground. Yeah. Yeah. One thing good about BMX, so sorry for all the listeners for putting this visual in our head. We wear like motocross gear. We don't wear spandex. So everybody was trying to picture Brian Brennan in a spandex outfit. The uh, Oh, I've I've got them in multicolors. I've got (laughs) full body suits. Uh, You know, my daughter calls me Aerodie Bry. (laughs) <laughs> uh, the aerodynamic helmets and all yeah. that crap used with the the, the uh, time trialing bikes but uh, yeah you know so i do that but you're probably referring to my football because that, that's yeah. that's yeah. one constant um yeah this is my 54th season of officiating uh football uh i used to do high school and college uh back in the 70s and the 80s and then business or the magazine work just got to be too much uh at that stage of my career so i backed out of college and i stayed with high school and i'm still doing it to this to this day and uh, come, <laughs> come the middle of of august till early december every year uh thursdays and fridays you know where you'll find me i'll be out on a field somewhere uh getting yelled at by somebody yeah. And, you ever you ever had a parent beat you up in the parking lot or threaten you? I'm sure no. you have at least threatens, right? Oh, it, it, we okay, never been beaten <laughs> up, and let's not go there. Um, uh, but yes, we've had situations where we've had to leave the field and go back to the locker room, and the, the home team has lost, and of course it was our fault, and and had some a couple of pretty dicey situations, and. Uh, to the point to where all of a sudden the police are there and all of a sudden the police are giving us escorts to our cars and then giving us escorts on our cars to the freeway and that sort of thing. Um, but I've never, it's never actually degraded to the point to where it became physical. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and I'd like to- out of a high school game one time when my um, niece was playing, was it volleyball or basketball? You gotta was, say allegedly. Allegedly it was basketball, it was Tiffany, and it was a Catholic school. <laughs> and Carrie got escorted out of the building. Because you were you were pass- hassling the referee, weren't you? It was the, uh, <laughs> well, I'll never forget we have a philosophy here in Orange County where if you have a child that's in a school, you're not allowed to officiate that school mm-hmm. as long as she's in a competitive sport within that school. Mm-hmm. Well, my daughter's senior year, she wasn't in sports. She was doing mock trial and, and some of these other things. And so they allowed me to officiate a, a major football game that involved her school. And I saw her before the start of the game. I saw her and her girlfriends down on the bottom and they're walking toward where their seats are. So I'm on the field in the end zone. So I go walking over to the fence and I go, Shannon. 
and she turns around and sees me. You might as well have thought I took a shot at her. I mean, she <laughs> she like, was more she was mortified. He's like, oh, I mean, man. why is this old man? I that, no, I don't know who that guy is. It, well, she immediately turned back and just kept going. <laughs> and well, later on, you know, the next day and all of that, um, hey, how come you didn't come over and say hi? And she goes, Dad, you embarrassed me. Uh, I mean, my friends found out that you're a football official. Oh, my God. That's like, I don't know how much lower on the ecological scale yeah. you can get, you know, Darwin scale. But I was there at the bottom. You remembered uh, that conversation when it went to buy her Christmas presents that year, didn't you? She got one. Oh, left. yeah. 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 The, the, um, uh, <laughs> I wrote, I wrote a, an article, I wrote my editorial for the December issue. Here's a spoiler alert. And basically it's about hot rodders who are now becoming grandparents. Um, you try to do some of those teaching things you did to your kids, you know, now that they have kids and you think you're contributing something positive to the family. Well, you soon find out that no, you know, I didn't like it when you did it before and I like it less now. <laughs> so I had my daughter write up a handful of things that I used to do when she was little and I crafted a, an editorial around it. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, it, it's fun stuff. You know, I mean, what we try to do when we're raising our kids is, is to make a decent human being out of them. I mean, that's the end game. I don't care if she hates cars, that that's absolutely irrelevant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as she's a good person and at which she is, she's turned out to be quite good. Um, it's my poor wife who has to suffer through all of my obnoxiousness with cars and football and everything else now, but hey. Hey, Ford, for all the listeners, everybody's heard stories about Kimmy. They've never yeah. been bad stories because she's probably <laughs> never listening like she was the other night. And yeah. before we started this, she popped in on this call and we seen her. She exists. Everybody thought <laughs> yes. what they call is a is a radio wife that like maybe yep. he named his blow up doll. We didn't really know. And it's like <laughs> didn't really have a human at home, but we seen her. She existed. And uh, so yeah, we've heard stories about Kimmy. So well, Ki Kimmy's claim to fame is her and Bobby are the best of buddies. Bobby will call here and say, "I don't want to talk to you. Where's Kimmy?" You and know, so Bobby seems to be very friendly with a lot of guys' wives. I have noticed that. He's a sly devil. You but know? I He's do know fine. his wife, Cindy, gives really good hugs, though, doesn't she? Oh, yes. Cindy's a sweetheart. <laughs> now, she is absolutely just a wonderful woman. And uh, God knows he hit above the bar. I mean, he landed so far above the bar on that one. It's not well, funny. They always have a vendor booth at the Tri-5 Nationals and, you know, Toby shows up, sets it up. Bobby comes in and out and hangs out, you know, and Toby does all yeah. the work. And so sure. one year Cindy was there and my dad, one of the first years that Bobby was there, my dad was there. My dad's a Tri-5 guy. So it's a sign of respect if I take my time to bring my dad by to meet you. Hey, this yeah. is my dad. This is Bobby Alloway. This, you've heard me tell stories about this because Bobby's one of those guys kind of like a mentor. I've always looked up to him. Honored to call him a friend now. I know you're very good friends with him. He's always been one of those guys. Hey, you ever need a question in business or anything I can help you with? Please let me know. I've been to his shop a few times and yeah. just an upstanding human, just good, good people. And um, so I take him by, hey, this is my dad. This is Alloway. This is his wife, Cindy. My dad doesn't even shake Bobby's hand. And my dad's a handshake guy, right? You got to have, he's had a hand a thumb ripped yeah. off, so he's like half numb. He about breaks people's hands. <laughs> he goes right up to Cindy and hugs her, and he's hugging her. He goes, Marriott, room 235, and watch <laughs> And Bobby's like, get your dad away from my wife. And the next morning, I mean, meet my dad at breakfast, and I go, did you sleep okay last night? He goes, just a little upset. And I go, why? He goes, Cindy Alloway never showed up. <laughs> <laughs> You, please, please, please say hi to your dad for me. I, I've only had the chance to meet him a couple of times, but he and I seem to just hit it off and have great conversations. And of course, you were at the other end of all of those conversations. So it was great time. It yeah, was very. We're getting text messages. He's actually in the hospital today. He was getting oh. really dizzy. He had a pacemaker last month. He's supposed to be getting a new, new knee in December. You know, he's still 76, runs 450 acres of farm and 100 head of cattle. Hey. And just Gee. go, go, go. But he's having a little uh, blood Setback. thin problem, a little dizziness going on today. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell him you said hi. So Yeah. And wish him the best for me. Yeah. He is a very good man. Good man. Yeah. Well, he raised me. Okay. 
Yeah. They have one, Everyone, one downfall. If, if you haven't Everyone. listened, we did my dad on one of the early podcasts. So go back yeah. through the list mm-hmm. and listen, listen to that. It's like he was the hardest to keep clean. And we said allegedly <laughs> more than we should have because he didn't want to get in trouble and everything. Yeah. So he's, he's a dandy. So a couple of well, things before we wrap it up, Carrie's got another yeah. thing coming up. Uh, one, it was fun and an honor to share the award stage with you at the Triple Crown yes. of Rotting. Uh, me and yeah. Kevin Oste worked all day and did interviews with all the industry badasses. And then you came up and helped us with the awards this year. Um, and then there was some slight shenanigans going on. Um, we raised a lot of money in like 40 minutes. Um, yeah. We did a podcast talking about the event. I did get quite a bit of hate after the fact from some people that just aren't the right people. You know, we raised $30,000 in 40 minutes for a military foundation, the Gary Sinise Foundation. And I said on that podcast, if they were upset, people were upset because they were waiting for the giveaway motor in the truck. And one, the awards take a little longer than a normal good guy show because we call their names and then they pull up. They don't know what they're getting. And I think that's part of the excitement. Custom Kemps of America has done that way for 45 years. You know, you got to stay for awards, but you don't know if you're just a 30, a 10 or street rod of the year. And I really like that a little bit more of excitement. It's a very big deal. Uh, the show was double yeah. what it was the year before. I don't know how big it's going to get the next couple of years, but it's just an amazing event. And it just it was an amazing group of people that just that, may not be recreated ever. We do those little charity auctions on Carrie's Cars and Cones trip, and it takes some special people for that to happen. Like I say, we raised 30 grand in like 40 minutes. Let me let me give you some final accounting. I'm doing the story right now. Mm-hmm. You remember the pinstripers? They had their own area over there, yep. and they were doing yep. raising. Okay, they raised 67,000 on their own. And they were 60, raising for a different, they were raising for a children's charity, right? Speed, Speedway's children's charities, yeah. And they raised sixty-seven thousand. Uh, final accounting on the fifty-fifty drawing, the Gary Sinise for the Gary Sinise Foundation, and then the shenanigans you're referring to on stage, and, and the ride-alongs with Kyle and Tucker. the ride-alongs. Yep, uh, that came to sixty-nine thousand and change. Man, that's incredible. And yeah, plus the giveaway truck, plus the giveaway engine, yeah. plus all of these other things that people could get. Uh, to say a good time was had by all is an understatement. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I had, that I was had a, blast. a tremendous event. Again, being looking up to Bobby, it's an honor that him and Gary Case have asked me to come help. I haven't yeah. really got the call for next year yet. I'm not really sure. Have you got to <laughs> come be on stage? I'm not really sure. I think Kevin Oste has. Kevin, I was like, I'm, I'm Ron Burgundy. I just show up. And Kevin yes. put a great program together. And Kevin is great. Uh, does a lot of great stuff in the industry. Has also two or three great podcasts and he put together the commercials and the stage show with the sound guys from Gulf. Yeah. Uh, oh man, I forget the sound guys. Um, well, I can tell you this. Johnson is just canceling on us again. He's stuck in traffic. <laughs> we, should just, we should just do Angie and forget Alan. Yeah, right. I would. The, um, it, it, Gary tells me and Bobby tells me they're going to go to bigger screens mm-hmm. on the side of the stage. And uh, they're going to talk to, uh, I hope they'll talk to our guy, um, uh, Ryan Foss, who is our drone. You know, he's our videographer, but he also handles the drone. So that during the awards, when the cars are up there, they'll have drone footage. So the people at the back of the audience can see on the bigger screens, the cars and the award being presented and all that much better. So I think there's some good stuff. coming down. And of course, you know, uh, they're going to use the infield grass next year, so there'll be another 300 cars they'll be able to pack in there. Oh, easily, because uh, the, the yeah. reason they couldn't do it this year because the season-ending IndyCar race was the very next yep. week, so they couldn't screw up the grass, which I went yep. with. It was amazing. And if, <laughs> with their Fox TV program, they have to end it earlier for football on Fox is why they're doing it. So the IndyCar is going – I think it's – Labor Day weekend, I think, I think so. it is. It's the weekend. Be- yeah, it is. It's yeah. the weekend before, and then it's us. Yeah. So but, uh, one more question. We're talking about magazines and stuff that I didn't ask you before. Is there anything, it can be car-related, magazine, knickknacks, keychains, football stuff. Is there anything that you like to collect other than cats? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Uh, as every hot rodder, I mean, I do have a fairly substantial collection of magazines but i also have 
what I think is maybe arguably one of the best collections of all of the car B movies that mm -hmm. came out in the fifties. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've got a couple of hundred of those. Oh, wow. And if a car was used in a television series, Route 66, 77, Sunset Strip, My Mother, the Car, I have, or the Dobie Gillis show, and it makes an appearance, or Life, uh, I have all of those TV shows on DVD. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've collected that, plus my favorite, Corvettes. I collected all of the print literature on early Corvettes from 1953 through 1967. Um, I do collect because we uh, talked you know, about your Corvettes. You have a couple Corvettes in the last podcast, and you think yep. that's ended when they stopped putting chrome bumpers on them. Oh yeah, nineteen seventy two. It's all over. Um, you know, uh, you know the press passes we get mm -hmm. when we go to the SEMA show. Okay, I've got literally hundreds upon hundreds of them after fifty some years of this, and they're all hanging in the barn, in the garage uh, up, you know, up north. Uh, the mugs, the pewter mugs from the L.A. Roadster show, I've got a staggering number That's of them. I've never been out for the Father's Day show. I go to Pomona for the Roadster oh. show. I've never been out for the Father's Day show. I need to go out there sometime for that. I really like Yeah, it. It, it's just one of those things just to notch up, you know, say you've done it. Um, T-shirts. This is the one that drives my wife nuts. You know, um, t -shirts. <laughs> we, we don't know how many we have, but it has to be a thousand. And now these shirts, I'm talking about not old shirts or shirts that have been worn. I'm talking about new shirts that go back to the Winter Nationals back in the mid-60s mm. and come all the way forward all through my Hot Rod Magazine career. I mean, God, I've got everybody's T-shirts and all of the event T-shirts and all that kind of good stuff. So if it's useless, I pretty much collect it. <laughs> you know what's the most useless thing that we collect? We seen that, that on an MTV Cribs episode from the guys from Blink One Eighty Two, I think. Ever since they switched to the credit card style room keys, the hotel keys, yeah, we yeah. keep those. Um, we have shoe boxes full of those things. Th this is a sad commentary. <laughs> Fortunately, we moved out of the building, but I used to collect those too, and I would two way tape, mm -hmm. and I would put them on my wall you know, my street router office wall, and it literally filled the room. And people would come in and look at that, and they knew right away I had no life or no future. <laughs> oh. oh, you're a rock star. You get to travel so much. You're yeah. so lucky. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the most famous line I get is, you are the luckiest guy in the world. Every weekend, you get to be at a different street route event. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, when you start waking up and you have no clue as to what city you're in, that's when you know, our, I got to tone this down. Our <laughs> problem is, I may not have got my room key from last weekend taken out of my wallet. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Then I was like, well, that's not it. And if, yeah, I did that from something to, that was, what would I do right after Triple Crown? Oh, we went to uh, oh, Tulsa because I got to host yes. the. Yeah. Uh, red carpet for the BMX Hall of Fame, and uh, I tried using my room from Triple Crown Weekend Key to get in my room and yeah. home yeah. the next weekend. I was like, "Oh, that's even a wrong brand of hotel." That's so, the thing. Uh, yeah. Hot Rod Power Tour. Yeah, by day three, you don't know where you're at, which hotel yeah. you're in, with yeah. what room key you've got. Like, hey, I, I, I go to all these events. I just got back from Texas, good guys, just last night, and uh, I felt so bad. I, I was tired. A back hurt. I need to go to the chiropractor. And both Friday and Saturday nights, I had dinner, visited with a couple guys at dinner, walked around the parking lot a little bit. Both nights, I was in my room before 9 o'clock. Oh, welcome to my world. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm up at 530 every morning to, you know, get my cooler ready and get to the autocross thing. And sometimes I like to go to swap meet before I go to the autocross yeah. and have to start working. And Oh, yeah. I, I got caught up in a hey, little So Let me give you a little tidbit on the hotels. Um for the next year's Triple Crown, do you have your room yet? No, because since I'm a, uh, I don't know if I'm supposed Celebrity. to be a hired person, <laughs> they hire me, they get me a hotel. Okay, because three of the hotels are already sold out. Yeah. There's eight, 800 rooms have already been booked. That's up to today. And over 500, I think it's close to 600 cars have already pre-registered. 
And if and, you're a vendor wanting to register, you better get in contact because they oh, yeah. out of vendors last year. So, yeah, and they're going to actually put a ceiling on how many entries uh, for next season, and I believe the ceiling's thirty five hundred, and and we know they got over three, so it's going to fill up pretty quickly. Yeah, uh, want to be there. I don't know where the host hotel is. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but Bobby said. I don't know about that host hotel. That's my Bobby Holloway accent. <laughs> they're, they're supposed to be putting it. Of course, he thinks I'm, me and Carrie are just the weirdest people ever, right? Yeah. Even though he's not, he likes live music and he comes to Nashville a lot and he offered us tickets and we took up, we went and seen a country girl that wants to be a rock and roll girl, Morgan Wade. I'd never heard of her seen at the rhyme. And he goes, oh, we have tickets. You want them? So he forwarded, you know, it's kind of cool. Bobby thought of us. And uh, so he thinks we do all this weird stuff, right? Because we listen to punk rock and all that. He goes, they're going to have at that host hotel probably that same weekend next year a comic something. <laughs> comic con. Yeah. Yeah. Comic con? Yeah. What is that? And then I go, dude, you need to look into that because those are big deals. Like I got to do an appearance one time with Lou Ferrigno when yeah. I was on TV. There was a, a real famous person, then a wannabe TV per car person. And he was actually on the phone with Sylvester Stallone talking about all the paid, you know, they charge for autographs and all this and paid meet and greets. And he's like, I can easily make when I go to these. And he goes, I'm not as famous as Sylvester. He goes, but I do all the meet and greets. He goes, I can easily make six figures on a weekend at a comic con at a big town. And he invited Jeez. me the next couple of weeks, next couple of months to go hang out with him at the Nashville one, but I was out of town and, but yeah, those comic cons, those are very big. So if Comic Con is in that, yeah, our hotels are going to be full of Comic Con people too. So if you get your hotel soon, because there's going to oh, be stuff going on in Murfreesboro. There is so much going on with that event that's not at the event mm -hmm. that uh, it's fun just to show up, just yeah. to show up. I know headquarters have been moved to the hotel next door because uh, of the Comic Con. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this and the stage will be over there for the nighttime entertainment on Friday night, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it'll be fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, I think we touched on most things that we, me and Carrie, talked without your recording <laughs> on your end. So is there anything else you want to add? You corrected a couple dates. Is there anything else after listening to it? It's like, oh, yeah, I screwed that up or I forgot that. No, I I think we're all good. I'm, there's plenty of screw ups in there, but that'll give people something to write comments about. You know, Brennan's <laughs> an idiot, and, and then I can get in there and go, yay! <laughs> you know? and, but at least, like I said, we had a lot of comments on people. You know, at two hours and thirteen minutes, and I'm like, they're actually listening that long. They haven't got tired of either one yeah. of us. But it, yeah, uh, so you've got pretty good company. The only other person's had a part two, but he had a part three. Was Daryl yeah. Starbird? And then well, come on, he's the man. And we have yeah. a part two coming up in the future with uh, Tom Taylor. Oh, so, good. Yeah. yeah. So we forgot to talk about all the 90s sport truck stuff when we did Tom's interview. <laughs> so, oh. He was a great one. So so we want to thank Mr. Brian Brennan mm -hmm. for being a guest on the Strange Motion Way podcast. Thank we want to thank you for taking care of house cats, cats outside. Yes. And we yeah. talked about you feed a possum. Now. Yes. And thank you very much for what you guys do at the In the Garage Media. You guys are killing it. Uh, thank you for keeping Rob Fortier employed. You probably get a government <laughs> check from him if you fill out the right paperwork. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you guys all kill it. And uh, again, in the garage media, Brian Brennan does modern rotting. Rob Fortier does classic truck performance. And Nick Licata does all Chevy. So keep doing it, man. Thank you. You guys have a great evening. You too. Thanks. See you later. Bye-bye. Hey, welders. Ready to upgrade your gear and save some serious dough in the process? The Miller Build with Blue Savings and Rebate Program has you covered. Find amazing deals and cashback rebates on a wide range of Miller products, from welders to plasma cutters and everything in between, all backed by our three-year warranty. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Take advantage of the Miller Build with Blue Program now. Visit us online or stop by your nearest Miller distributor today to start saving.